mentioned, welcome everybody. My name is Nicole Warshauer. I head up community over at Trusted Health, which is the place for the modern nurse. And we have an amazing array of resources for nurses. Not only do we place nurses in travel roles all across the country, but we also have a podcast, we have a blog, we have virtual events like these, and hopefully in the near-ish future in-person events again. And we're really, really happy that you're coming to us tonight to learn about communication. So, Lori, if you can go to the next slide. A couple things before we get going. Number one, you're going to have questions tonight, and we really, really encourage you to ask them. We want to make sure we have lots of time for discussion and communication, since this is about communication. So any questions you have, please pop them in the Zoom chat, and Casey will flip them over to Lori when we have some question time. This is your chance to listen, learn, and connect, not only from Lori, but from each other. And then lastly, just get inspired to communicate for change. So the agenda, before I hand it over to Lori, we're going to talk about the art of communication, communication conditions, how to communicate for change, trust and communications, and then are you ready to communicate? And then lastly, we're going to talk about how to start crucial conversations, which is personally my favorite part of this conversation. So with that, I am really thrilled to introduce Lori Armstrong, and she'll take it from here. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. The only thing better would be if we were actually in person, um, but I'm glad I could see you all. I did a presentation this morning for like 200 people and all I did was stare at a dot in the camera. It was awful. So I'm glad to see so many of you. Um, so again, Lori Armstrong, my official title for the last six months is Chief Clinical Officer and CEO at Inspire Nurse Leaders. And Inspire Nurse Leaders specializes in educating and growing nurse leaders to become their best, to achieve the best outcomes for themselves, their teams, the frontline, and of course, our patients and families. I won't bore you with my whole bio. Been a nurse a long time. Um, all of a sudden, I turned around and it was 30 years. I don't know how that happened, and I don't like to admit it because then some of you can do the math, and I hope your calculators are all broken on your phones. Don't do it. Um, but a nurse 30 years, uh, neonatal ICU nurse originally by background and training, manager, director, and then I had the honor for 15 years of being a chief nurse. So thrilled and had a notion during the pandemic to make a, a um, try to make a, a bigger impact, reach more staff um, by starting my own company. So here I am, and I have um, some great colleagues and friends at Trusted Health, and I'm a big fan. So you're very fortunate to be working with and for Trusted Health. Um, really, that's kind of boring, everything I said, because the most important thing is that I am a, a, a fanatic mother of two adorable Boston Terrier dogs. So anybody out there that is a dog fan in Boston Terrier, Lulu and Belle keep me really, really busy. So it's great to be here and I'm really excited about today. Um, I wanna underscore something Nicole said, please. I want this to be a conversation, not just because it's about communication, but because um, I just think the most effective way for us to learn is for me to share information, to share our stories and to really be able to tackle some specifics and the challenges of what you're dealing with on the front lines, if you're a frontline provider and if you're a leader or a nurse leader in a role, I'm happy to share. Um, and sometimes I'll have the answer and sometimes I won't, but we'll be able to talk and learn from each other. So feel free, we'll make this as informal as possible. So I already gave you a little bit of a snippet about my journey, very traditional journey in, in my career of nursing, but I wanna, I wanna stop there. And I wanna tell you a little story, a story that really put my feet on the right path and has led me to where I am today and what I'm doing today. So we need to rewind a little bit, rewind a couple of years. I decided after four years of being a neonatal intensive care nurse, I wanna make sure I'm on the right slide before I start. Okay, sorry about that. 
Um, I decided after four years as a neonatal intensive care nurse to transfer to the pediatric intensive care. At the time, I didn't know that PICU nurses didn't think much of NICU nurses and that NICU nurses might not always think that NICU, uh, PICU nurses were the friendliest. Now I know that's a unanimous feeling across the United States, but I transferred to the PICU. I walked into the PICU one Saturday night for my first of three consecutive 12 hour shifts. I received my assignment and of course I had a critically ill child. We were extremely short and we were full. I had a liver failure patient who was intubated on high settings, multiple drips and was paralyzed. As if the night wasn't gonna be hard enough, Bob was in charge. So I knew Bob was the charge nurse. It was gonna be even harder. I don't know why he didn't like me. Did he not like me just because he didn't like my personality or he didn't like me because I was a NICU nurse? Or did he not like me because he thought I wasn't a very good nurse? I don't know, but I just knew it wasn't gonna be good. And I left the open bay area and walked down to my patient's room who was at the end of the hall in isolation um, to get report. Three hours into the shift, my patient's specialty bed malfunctioned. And remember, I said he was intubated and paralyzed. The specialty bed malfunctioned and he, a seven-year-old, I'll never forget him, started sinking into the mattress, hanging literally by a thread or more importantly, hanging by a ZT tube. I screamed for help. I screamed for help. I couldn't reach the code button. I screamed for help, nobody came. I screamed louder, nobody came. And I don't know if you noticed any accent yet, but it's still there occasionally. I'm originally from New York, so I'm not quiet. But I yelled and nobody came. I finally saw out of the corner of my eye a box that was sitting on that patient bedside table. And I was able to grab it, prop this child's head up. His name was Steven. Prop, prop Steven's head up so he was safe and stabilized. And I ran to the main pediatric intensive care area to see if someone could help me. And there I found Bob sitting at the nurse's station. He didn't come. He didn't answer my cries for help. And right then and there, there was no time. And I certainly was not gonna waste any energy asking him why he didn't come. I screamed loud right at him and said, I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if you don't think I'm a good nurse. My patient needs you. I need your help. And he got up, followed me. We took care of Steven. Got, we, Bob troubleshot the bed that was malfunctioning. We tucked Steven in, he was safe. Bob, without a word to me, turned and walked out of the room. We never spoke, but my patient was safe and that's all I cared about. Four weeks later, I resigned from that unit. I resigned, but it wasn't because of Bob. I resigned because of the response I got from my manager. It took me two weeks of repeated emails and phone messages to her to get a response after what happened. And when I met with her, she was unprepared, unable to articulate the seriousness of the situation that I shared with her and unwilling to address Bob's behavior. I resigned. Some of you might have a Bob, but that's the true meaning. That's the one of the reasons I've been on this lifelong journey. My lifelong passion as a bedside nurse to speak the truth, as a nurse leader to help others speak their truth. And now as the CEO and chief clinical officer of my own company to spend 100% of my time helping nurses, individual nurses and teams have a bigger impact, have bigger influence. 
all with our eye on the prize of in improving the outcomes of patients and families we serve. And it literally all starts with communication. So I'm glad you're here today to talk about communication. And I had to tell the story. I had to because it is emblazoned in my mind and I still can't stand Bob. And I'm talking about him all these years later because he made such an impression on me. So communication is important. In fact, it's one of the most, if not the most important life skill you learn because it's how you present yourself. It's how people begin to know who you are and what you stand for. And oh, did I say already that it's hard? It's hard, it doesn't come naturally. And you know, Nicole and Casey shared comments, answers that you all provided to questions when you registered for today. And I was so glad that they did because it was about not only you having the confidence to communicate, right? So I hope you get some tips and tricks and techniques and at least a starting framework work on how to communicate more effectively and to be more confident, but also about the challenges that you face because when you go to your leader or your manager, they don't seem to know how to communicate. They either don't respond or they're not effective in their communication style. And although that really, really hurts my heart and soul, I want you to know how common it is because most nurse leaders don't have special training in communication and not just about executive communication. You know, we all want to look fancy when we show up at meetings and make a big impression, but really just speaking effectively and authentically with our teams, it's a basic competency. And a lot of nurse managers and nurse leaders haven't had the opportunity to have that training. So I already said it's hard. I'll probably say that like five more times during this talk. It's hard, difficult conversations. And that's why, you're, that's why you signed up today. You wouldn't be here if you hadn't experienced difficult situations, different conversations, difficult conversations. And if you if you felt comfortable and confident, you wouldn't be here, okay? In your communication skills. So I'm glad you're here. Kudos to you. But doesn't it, doesn't it, isn't it curious to you about some people who seem to effortlessly glide through hard conversations, even when they're risky or controversial? emotional conversations. Skilled people and skilled communicators seem to find a way to present relevant information. Even if it's a high stress environment, they seem to be able to do it calmly and concisely. We're gonna go through some of those tips. I've often gotten feedback that, oh my God, how did you do that? And my response is, you didn't see my knees knocking together and shaking because I was so nervous but I've learned the skills and techniques I'm gonna share and I still get nervous inside after all these years. It's okay to be a little nervous. There's permission to be nervous. Dialogue. What's the true definition of a dialogue? Cause that's what it's all about. Free flow of meaning between two or more people. And this slide actually says it all, why communication is so hard. Because there's other people involved, you know? Especially more than two, that's it. And in this day and age, this is what I can't stand the most. See this? The texting. I'll be in a meeting with my team and I see people texting and I'm thinking, okay, they didn't like what I said. They're talking to each other or two people are communicating with each other, perhaps about someone else in the room. We're gonna go through some of those behaviors. Try not to get sucked up in that, but free flow and meeting between two or more people, it gets complicated because humans are involved, multiple humans. And right now, the conditions, communication condition. There's lots of external threats to good communication and internal threats to good communication. And right now conditions are really rough and rocky, okay? 
So I wanna spend a little time on that. You know, if you signed up for a webinar right now, any speaker had to talk about the year of the nurse and COVID's impact on it. So just, just bear with me. Um, all of us are living through and working through the most extraordinary challenge of our career. In fact, likely of our lifetime. Ever since those first images came on our news feeds and on any screen of COVID-19 of the first admitted patient, it was the nurse at the core. It was the nurse. Images burned into our memories. Patients we cared for, our colleagues cared for, our friends cared for, they hold a permanent place in our, in our heart, in our soul, in our minds. And it's nurses who at the core of this pandemic. In fact, it has earned us another year. We all knew that 2020 was the year of the nurse. Woo, yay, we had a lot planned. Boy, did those get scrapped because of COVID-19. But I believe that 2020 being the year of the nurse was divinely appointed to us divinely because it put nurses exactly where we were supposed to be in the spotlight, telling the world about our role, our importance and our value, okay? And I'm taking the time here to share this because if just a few of you leave today feeling a little bit more confident in the right you have to use your voice to communicate more effectively and more often and more confidently, then I will consider this successful. So we have the world stage because of COVID-19, perhaps the silver lining of the pandemic if there is one. And it's so important that now we have another year, 2020 expanded to 2021, not a week, not a year, two years. And with that comes responsibility that place we have, that global attention, we have to do something with it. And building your skills is the number one call to action for nurses so that we can have even a bigger, a bigger impact in this world, in our profession. I could spend the entire time giving you the science and the data. I don't wanna put you to sleep, but I am gonna share a little data with you. Um, I could spend the whole time telling you the role that you play and how important it is, okay? That nurses matter, that you matter. And through the eyes of patients, for sure, you are a leader. You know that saying, clothes don't make the man or clothes don't make the woman? Titles don't make the leader. Titles don't make the leader. Behavior makes the leader. And trust me, through the through the eyes and hearts of your patients, you are leading the care, the nurse. And that picture on your screen out in front, that's you. That's each and every one of you. That's us as nurses leading the way to better health in this country. Did you know that care delivered in the entire globe? Think about all the care, healthcare that's delivered in the world, the whole world. 90% of it travels through the hands of a nurse. Just sharing that with you guys gives me chills, okay? 90% of the healthcare delivered in this world travels through the hands of a nurse. That's how important you are. That's how important how you show up and how you communicate matters. Yes, we're gonna talk about your daily challenges of the unit and it starts there. If you're advocating for more staff, if you're complaining about Bob, someone who's really disrupting the healthy environment in your unit, how you communicate makes a difference and it all adds up to safe patient outcomes. So it starts with each and every one of you and you already took the step because you're here today, okay? Bob missed his opportunity and I know each one of you have a Bob. I hate telling the story, my son's name is Bob and so is my father, so I feel bad. My son's name is actually Rob. Bob sounds too old, but you get it, it's Robert. Um, my manager failed to communicate and to react appropriately. That doesn't work anymore, it doesn't cut it. Did you ever hear the saying, but she's a good nurse or he's a good nurse? 
or she was a good nurse if they're a manager now, you know, now that they're a manager, that's not okay. It's not enough to be a good clinician, being a good communicator, being a good team member. You have to be the whole package because of the role we play. And it starts with you leading care transformation. I love this slide. I love all the slides actually. I love this slide though, because the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place, okay? The singest, single biggest problem. So when you are trying to communicate with someone, you say, you say your piece, you share your story, and then you leave the meeting or the room. You assume that your intended message was delivered in a way that the person understood it. Your manager believes that when they have a staff meeting and they're communicating the 10, 15 line items that you are understanding exactly how he or she meant for you to understand it and how the intent was to deliver it. And that's not the case. Unless there's a closed loop of communication and an equal confirmation that what I intended to communicate and delivered was received, then you are not completely sure communication has occurred. And that's really, really important step of reflection. First step in understanding the complexity of communication. How do you know that your message was received as you intended? And in our world, in the world of nursing, in all the stresses that you face every day with staffing, with disgruntled patients, with violence increasing at the unit level, whether it's a patient or their family member, with team members who are not happy, it's all stress that affects communication because when you're stressed and you're communicating, your anxiety goes up. When someone's communicating with you and your stress is at a high, your brain, I'll be simple about it, your brain actually starts to shrink. Your ability to process information decreases. Your ability to hear all your senses, they narrow. It's a physiological response to stress. Another reason why effective communication is often an illusion. Think about that. Even today, after all these years, when I know I'm going into a stressful situation, whether I'm going in with someone that perhaps I don't see eye to eye with, or as a leader, maybe I had to sit down and provide um, uncomfortable information with somebody. Um, I write, I'm going to give you these tips. I actually write everything out because I know my stress level is high and I want to make sure that my main messages are received. So I write everything down because I know when I get stressed, I can't focus like I usually do. So just your first tip there. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And I also love this slide. I think Nicole reworded my slide and she was spot on how to communicate like a boss with your boss. Now, some of you might be rolling your eyes and said, oh my God, I don't wanna communicate like my boss because my boss is a terrible communicator. Um, and that might be the case. Remember, not all leaders were trained appropriately in communication. I did a national presentation this morning with about 200 people attending all nurse leaders. It was way too early, by the way. I'm never agreeing to that again. It was 6.30 on my coast and my, I just needed more coffee, I think. Anyway, um, I did a live survey poll and asked if they had been trained in executive communication or executive presence. 78% of them said they hadn't been trained. 78%. So if any of you are wondering why, I'm not, I'm not excusing it because if you're in a formal leadership role, you need to seek out training. 78% um, have never been trained. Um, I want you to know all that I got promoted first to my assistant nurse manager job. Yes, I know it was a while ago, but I got promoted because I was the best IV starter in the neonatal intensive care unit. Not, should not be a requirement to be a leader 
a leader of people and patient care. I could get the IV in bed, not good. Okay, so there are rules and evidence behind communication. This is science. I'm not, I didn't just put pretty icons on a slide. What the data tells us for communication to be the most effective it can be, you need to include seven C's, okay? The seven C's of communication. This has been studied for a long time and it's still relevant when it was first published. I think it was published in 1970, a very long time ago. I was even, you know, very small. I won't tell you how old. Um, seven C's, clear, concise, concrete. And we're gonna go over this in a minute. Correct, coherent, complete, and courteous. Not all of these are easy, okay? And it takes reflection and it takes an effort for all of you when you're thinking about effectively communicating it takes time for reflection. And you all oftentimes are too busy for that. Remember, or you, we think we're too busy. Remember when I had to get Bob's attention? I raised my voice, I yelled. You know, as I think back, did I have to yell? He was right in front of me. Did I also tell you I stomped my foot like a child in the middle of the PICU? I think I might've left that part out, I'm not sure but I did, my anxiety and stress was so high. Um, I did some things I probably shouldn't have, okay? I own it. Be clear, be concise. Um, I have a little trouble with this one. This one takes time for me to think, to take the message and make it more concise and focused. Concrete, be specific and definite. Correct, number four is my favorite. How many times have you heard stories that get your ire up, get you really upset, and then when you investigate, if you investigate it, it's not accurate. So I encourage you to make sure any information that you're sharing is accurate, because it's a big time waste, big time waste to share inaccurate information. Is it coherent? Is it complete? Do you have all the pieces of information? This is another hot one for me, when you all are going to your manager and you wanna present a request to them, completeness is critical. Take the time to gather the evidence, gather the data, just like you would do in any care plan. You're developing a care plan for your patient. You wanna be complete about it. And you know, don't say anything. If you can't say anything nice, don't say it at all. Be courteous, polite. This is a professional environment where professional registered nurses or licensed vocational or practical nurses, we need to be polite and respectful at all times. So I know that I'm going fast, I'm so sorry, but you know, Trusted Health would only give me an hour. If you write on the evaluation that I totally was not boring and you didn't fall asleep, maybe we could have a little follow-up because this, honestly, I'm not kidding. This is an eight hour day. I do an eight hour class on communication. So um, I'm not trying to get great evaluations, Nicole and Casey, but maybe. Anyway, trust and communication are, are very closely linked. And um, you might not realize that I think you do because you live it every day. Trust is eroding, not only in the political landscape and in our country, but trust is eroding within our, our profession. And if communication, if trust is at the core of communication, then we have to communicate properly. You build trust often with your words, what you're saying, right? And when you link your words and what you do or your action, that's where the magic happens. That's where the trust is built. That's where relationships get stronger. When you do what you said you were gonna do. One of the most important, important leadership behaviors there could be. Just like with your patient, if you're not in a formal leadership role, just like with your patient, if you tell them you're gonna be back in an hour to check on them, to check on if their pain medication was effective, if whatever intervention you just started is working, go back, do what you say you're gonna do. And for leadership, it's even more critical. You really erode trust when you promise frontline staff something and you never circle back and you never follow through. 
do what you say you're going to do. Okay, remember I said I was going to probably make you roll your eyes and uh, share the data. Here's the data. Here's the data on work environments with leaders and frontline staff who, who, who deem their environment, who describe their environment as healthy. Healthy work environments have high levels of effective communication and high levels of trust decrease medical errors. It's right out of the literature. I'm not making this up. Lower rates of readmissions. When frontline nurses have higher skills and competency and effectively communications, patients are less frequently readmitted. Think about that. It's amazing. It's amazing. That's how important it is for you all, not only to be strong in communicating, but that you have the support and resources you need to practice at your highest level. There's higher patient satisfaction. I won't read the whole slide. I'll just tell you the ones I like the most, okay? I love lower turnover rates. That means we have more nurses at the bedside and the notion of someday not being short staff will come, come to a reality. Um, but today for nurses feeling valued and they make a difference, that's where I wanna work. That's the unit I want to be associated with. That's where I want to be the chief nurse, that nurses leave work and feel valued. High trust, effective communication. More science. If you don't know a lot about the healthy work environment model, evidence-based, been around since about the year 2000. It's part of our practice. I want you to take a look. The American Association of Critical Care Nurses has a great website. And there's a six component model that's been tested over and over again. It's really great. Their, their website is fantastic. And actually I've partnered with the AACN and have developed a um, healthy workforce environment course, healthy work environment course um, online with my company, but skilled communication, look where the red arrow is, right? Skilled communication is the first the first of six critical components for a healthy work environment, because that's where it all starts. And when you go on the website, it outlines all the behaviors and expectations of nurses for skilled communication. It has a set of behaviors for managers and leaders, and it has a set of behaviors for frontline staff. I want you to take a look at it. It's pretty awesome but it was too, too much to add into this presentation. So, but I just wanted to highlight that it's critical. Go on their website when you can. Okay, so we've talked about effective communication. Let's talk a little bit about what is often ineffective communication, venting, right? The break room can be really, when we used to be able to go to the break room, used to be very entertaining sometimes and really truly a safe place for us many times. Stresses and annoyances of work build up day after day, time after time. The Bobs of the world, I wasn't his only victim. He had a lot of victims. And going to the break room, going to the break room is a place that you can complain. It's not uncommon, it happens all the time, it's inevitable, but it's not always the best strategy. And I ask that you really take a moment to think about whether it's effective or not. There's a right way to vent and a not so right way to vent. Um, if any of you are online, I'd love for you to Google a great speaker. Um, her name is Cy Wakeman, C-Y. Her last name is Wakeman. She does a lot on venting. She's a social worker by clinical background and training, but her research is in, don't get mad, her search is in drama, drama in the workplace. And she does a lot on venting. Plus she's, she might as well be a stand-up comedian. She's so funny, but she's a keynote at a lot of nursing conferences. And I learned a lot from her about appropriate and inappropriate venting. Venting occurs at the frontline level. It occurs at the leadership level. It occurs in the C-suite, trust me. And you don't wanna to contribute to negativity. So how is the best way to vent effectively, okay? 
I alluded to this a little bit before. When you're go, when you're upset, when you're stressed, and you need to talk to someone about it, and I pray that you all have a safe person that you can trust and talk to. It's critical to have someone like that. Um, before you do it, take time out. It's always the first step. Take time out. Get a breather. Walk around the block. Wait a couple of days before you start talking about it because your stress will decrease. And remember I said your brain kind of shrinks when you're stressed, when the stress starts to alleviate, you're able to think through things more clearly, okay? Like me being able to recognize just a few days later that I shouldn't have stomped my foot like a big child, even though he deserved it, by the way, um, it, when I was in the PICU. Take time out to calm down write it down, always helpful to tell your story in writing. Then you're able to see the words, take the emotion out of it. Balance the negative and positive. There's always, always positives in situations. And then use those seven C's that I shared with you. You can download the deck and, you know, take that slide and put it up there, you know, paste it somewhere or save it to your phone. Um, those are my initial tips and tricks and techniques. We have a little bit more time, but this is where I'm going to stop right here. I hope you all have some questions with what I just breezed through real quickly in 39 minutes. Questions. All right. So Chris has a couple questions I'd like to ask uh, you, Lori. Um, I think this is in regards to the, um, to the, I'm going to say this wrong, AACN. Yes. Um, AACN guidelines. Um, so why don't more hospitals and healthcare settings adopt this? That is a great question. And I'm going to add to that. Why don't more hospitals and healthcare settings adopt many of our professional standards in nursing, right? Um, I wish they did. There's a myriad of reasons. I'll start first and foremost with finances. Um, there might be a cost associated with taking on a new project. If you look at the AACN standards, they even give you a playbook, a toolkit of how to implement them. They're amazing. But I will tell you that one of the reasons is a lack of knowledge of, I'm going to say people, agnostic of role, a lack of knowledge of people that they even exist. So that's why it is essential for, you know, I always start with myself. And, and when I was a bedside nurse, I was always, I had a mentor who put my feet on the path, my feet on the right path right away. And I immediately became a member of the National Association of Neonatal Nurses, my original clinical background, NICU. Um, be a part of your national organization because once you're a part of your national organization, you're exposed to evidence-based practice. Even though each of us are required by holding that license that we hold, every state requires us to stay on top of evidence-based practice, many of us don't take advantage of that. And disappointingly so, many leaders are not involved in their association for a variety of reasons. Um, and they're not as enlightened as they should be. So hence, many of myself, my colleagues um, on a mission, never ending mission to train and educate and inspire others to higher levels of practice. And I think that if you're at an organization that does not have this framework, take it, take it to your shared governance council, take it to your practice council, whatever the title of it is, sit down, make an appointment with your manager. I know some of you may say they might not like it, but you have to try and you have to start. We owe it to each other. We owe it to the profession and we owe it to our patients and families. Thank you for that question. It's awesome. Yeah, great question. Um, she also asked, uh, how do you effectively communicate with people whose culture may play a role in not communicating directly? Fantastic question. Um, Casey, I don't know if it's okay. Can I skip down to a future slide because it's on that slide? Is okay. that okay with you? No, that's fine with me. <laughs> okay, so there are a lot of barriers to appropriate communication, okay? So it's a great question. 
So um, social and family and cultural. I'm sorry, my doorbell is ringing. No one ever rings the doorbell. I don't know what's happening, sorry. So social and family and cultural differences impact communication. And, you know, if somebody, I wanna say individually, individually, we need to seek to understand how best people communicate. Okay, so I'm very, um, I would say people see me as extroverted and I'm very comfortable speaking to other people. Not everyone is like that. Um, and you have to have a level of self-awareness that someone might not be comfortable. Ask them. I always encourage people, ask them how best they like to be communicated with. And if you see, if you have a certain patient, I'll put it um, in through the lens of patients and families particularly with certain patient population, um, perhaps Muslim families, um, Orthodox Jewish families, they, they have different familial and cultural norms that absolutely impact the way we communicate and who we communicate information to. And I would put onus on that to the organization. Um, in, your interpreter department can help with this, but also social work can help with this to mobilize efforts to educate and train and provide the nursing staff with knowledge about what works and what doesn't work with certain cultures, okay? Since we're on this slide, you can see the other influencers or barriers to communication. And I think what it speaks to, to me, is that everybody is different. And if each of you take a moment to seek to understand and have some clarity around, you know, maybe everyone's not like me and maybe everyone isn't as comfortable. Let me find out how best they communicate. Perfect. Um, Lori, just for the sake of time, let's continue on. And I'm gonna save these rest of these questions for um, the next question section. Okay, I'm gonna find where I left off, hang on. I want you to have a checklist for the next time you're in a difficult situation with a coworker or your boss. Just a checklist for you to go down. If you're like me, I have to have a list. I have to check it off and make sure I did every one, especially when stress is high. Know that you're going into the conversation to make a difference, okay? You wanna make a positive difference. And I think that many times we go into situations like this where we want our way, we want to be right, and we want to win. That's, that's, not, that's not the proper strategy for having an effective outcome or having an effective communication. It's really about seeking to understand where the other person is coming from and how you both can come to an agreement on whatever the issue is. Um, you know, and many times, especially in our world, especially in, for each and every one of you who are advocating perhaps for more resources, for like me um, as a, le a, a formal nurse leader for so long, I was advocating for resources all the time as well. And I didn't, I wasn't always successful, but seeking to understand the other person's point of view and agreeing upon at least a path forward, that's the number one step. I said, take the time out before, um, and I put it on this slide again, because that's how important it is to take your time. Let the stress go down, write it down, get organized. Um, one of the questions in the survey um, data um, about what you all want, many of you wanted to get out of this talk is about how do you go about it? What are the words? What's the language that leaders use? And I would say going to the evidence is critical. Getting the whole story, making sure you validated what actually happened with what you wanna to bring to your leader and go to the evidence, it's critical. The question that was asked about the AACN, use the AACN evidence to your advantage, okay? It not only strengthens your argument, it makes you um, looked upon as an educated and informed professional and it also can strengthen and further your request and your case because you're backed by evidence-based practice. It's really, really powerful. Acknowledge how important the, the communication that you're having is, the, the conversation that you're having. Um, telling your leader that it took a lot for you to make this appointment and this conversation 
is important to you and the outcome is important to you. You know, many leaders, um, you know, brings a tear to my eye when I think about how happy I was when frontline staff felt comfortable enough to come to me and bring their concerns forward. I was just thrilled about it. I wanted more people that engaged. Um, again, balance the positive with the negative. Our brains, another physiological fact, our brains are wired to hear the negative. Our brains are wired. So make sure there's a balance of positive. You're not going in to dump everything on your leader or a coworker and make the environment even more negative. There are always try to find the positive in whatever you're talking about. And then last but not least, send and receive. Send and receive. What does that mean? That's the piece I spoke about where there's an illusion that communication occurred. And there are some in the deck, I hope we get to it, in the deck, there's a slide that offers you a template for an opener of your communication to have with whoever you're having it, if it's your boss or your coworker or a physician colleague to talk about the plan of care for a patient. Make sure the message that you intended to send is actually received in the way you intended it. And the only way to do that is at the end of the conversation to say, let's review what we discussed, okay? It's the only way to confirm. Next slide. So questions to ask yourself, okay? Four questions to ask yourself. What is the issue that needs to be addressed? Okay, that sounds like when I first when I first learned that, what is the issue we need to address? Of course, everyone knows the issue to be addressed. In fact, not everybody comes to the table thinking of the problem the same way. So making sure you clarify what exactly needs to be addressed. What are the facts? I cannot underscore enough the importance of you validating factual information. Let's face it, face it, this is how I describe it. Negativity and gossip is like commodity in a unit. And I encourage you not to get involved and not to get sucked into that, okay? What does the resolution look like? Someone might ask you, what, what, what is the outcome you'd like to see? And you don't wanna get caught off guard by that question. Think through that. If you're going in to have a difficult and concerning conversation, Think about what the outcome is that you think would best serve the unit, would best serve you, and of course, most importantly, best serve the patients and families that we serve. And oh, this is one of my favorites too. Think through how others in the room are going to react. Because I don't like being caught off guard. I, I sometimes, if I get caught off guard, I, I, I get all discombobulated. I don't know if you're like that, but when I'm in a high stress situation and a question comes at me that I really didn't think about or wasn't prepared for, it can really derail my whole strategy and make me less effective. So if you take some time, oh boy, there's that word, that phrase again, take some time. If you take some time to think about how people in the room are gonna react, you might actually be prepared for it and can react to it in a very professional, educated and informed manner. Next slide. Hey, Lori, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time. Can we take okay. a couple questions? I can, Is that okay? oh, no problem. All right. Casey, you wanna float a few to Lori? And then Lori, do you want me to go over to crucial conversations so we can end on that after this, these questions? Sure, of course. I didn't get to show my Zoom cat slide, which is very disappointing. But I, that's will, okay. I will advance. I, I trust everyone. I, I wasn't going to play the video, but it makes me smile. Um, I felt so bad for the guy. I'll advance through that so everyone can breeze and see it while Casey floats those questions to you. It's great. Okay. It is fantastic. Really if you haven't looked it up, you should Google it. Um, so uh, we have a question. Is it possible to recover from a reputation of being negative, the complainer, or the, in, the venter? Oh my God. If I could plant questions, that would be one of them. Um, so I love this question. And actually, it's really, really hard to recover, but it's totally doable. It's totally doable. 
it's not easy. And I'm gonna give you some tips on how to do it. First of all, having an attitude or taking the time to self-reflect that you recognize that you're being negative and you have a reputation for it, that is a huge step and good for you, whoever is do, whoever did it or is doing it. And then be honest about it. This takes a little bit of vulnerability. If you all haven't read much or watched the Netflix special uh, by Brene Brown, she's awesome. And she talks a lot about vulnerability and being open and honest about, you know, I realized I've been being a little negative and I got some feedback that I'm kind of a Debbie Downer and I don't want to be like that anymore. So I'm going to start changing. Having that conversation first with some trusted friends makes sense. Um, and you can't trust everyone, but having that conversation with some trusted friends and they'll hold you accountable totally, totally will put you on the path to recover from that. Then what I want you to think about is that recovering from that and becoming less of a complainer and somebody who wants to make a more positive um, difference or in, have more positive influence, think about it as a big empty bank account or a big empty piggy bank. And you're gonna make small deposits every day, every shift into that account. Small, it only takes little small steps. Some of those steps might be being more authentic. Some of those steps might be doing what you said you were going to do. Some might be, you know, you're at work and say, can I help you? Maybe you didn't say that as much previously. Little small deposits. And before you know it, after a few weeks, after a month, the, the bank account gets big enough and people start changing their perception of you. Thanks, Lori. Um, sure. We have another question. Is the vulnerable leader an effective leader? I'm going out on a limb here. I don't, I, you might get HR complaints after this because whoever asked that question and all the questions, I love them. I love them. Um, I think the vulnerable leader is one of the best leaders. The vulnerable leader is the best leader because vulnerability shows authenticity. It shows integrity. It shows humanity. And, you know, early on, and I've chill saying that, so seriously, I love it. Um, you know, in the beginning of COVID, probably about three months in, because I'm addicted to liter uh, leadership, uh, liter literature, books, and articles, it started to say that COVID-19 was revealing leaders. It was revealing good leaders, and it was revealing ineffective leaders. And the leaders who have been the most effective have been authentic leaders and vulnerable leaders who said, you know what, I don't know the answer. And you know what, I'm not sure when our next shipment of X, Y, or Z is coming, but we're here for you. And we're gonna be here every four hours to update you on whatever it is. And you know, prior to COVID-19, vulnerability, authenticity, integrity, being engaging, those were considered like soft skills of a leader no more are they the soft skills. They are the skills of a leader. So the vulnerable leader are the best leaders. Thanks, Lori. Um, our next question is, do you have any recommendations for leadership material to read or listen to? Um, so podcast requests as oh well. Oh my God, that is, you guys are gonna think I'm the biggest dork ever, but wait a second. I know I have my favorite book here. Where is it? I'm gonna say that I'm a dork. And I won't be, oh, my computer's on it. Hang on one second. I'm going to go up and down because that's how important this is to me. Okay. So literally, I don't go a day without this book. I might not open it every day, but this book is called The Leadership Challenge by Dr. Barry Posner and Dr. Jim Kuzis, world's leading leadership researchers. And the operating system that they have is for everyone, not just for the formal leader, because remember, title doesn't make a leader, okay? They actually just came up with, out with a brand new book about leaders, about leadership of people who don't have a formal title. I don't know the 
title of it offhand, but if you Google the leadership challenge, it'll come right up. And this book changed my career as a, as a, I was a new manager when I was exposed to it. And it talks about simple behaviors that influence those around you. So I, I am, I am a big fan of this. Um, I'm trying to think of all the podcasts I listen to. So Nicole, I can't come up with all of them off the top of my head. Can I send them to you and Casey and then maybe you could email them out? I'm happy to add any of your recommendations to our wrap up email. So okay. and I know we're close on time. Um, I, Lori, your advice is indispensable. So I don't wanna go too much over. Um, I will, I promise y'all, I will get all those recommendations from Lori and I will put them in the wrap up email. Lori, I'll ask you for them probably tonight so I don't forget. Okay. Um, the crucial conversation piece, we do have the slides. Yes. Lori, is there anything you want to highlight for maybe like a minute or two and then we can wrap it up? What about crucial conversations? Yes. yes. Okay. So listen, I know you're busy. Everybody on this call is busy. And attitude is everything. And when you show up with an attitude of positivity, and, and authenticity and respect, things are gonna get better. I didn't say they were gonna get easier. I said, they're gonna get better. Be patient. Um, I have two more things to say. Second thing is crucial conversations. You all, you know, I'm not sure what type of um, education reimbursement you have depending on your work situation. This is, if you're looking for education and training, my company has a couple of one hour courses that will help you. However, Crucial Conversations is like the Bible to effective communication. They have books, they have workbooks, they have a blog, they have videos you can look up on YouTube. And their framework is, you can see it up on the screen, I'm not gonna read the bullet points, but their framework is simple and practical and really, really the true like, the true north for effective communication in the workplace and even out in the community. So if you have the chance and you have the means and funds to go through the course, I totally encourage you to do that. You want me to read my final thoughts, Casey? I mean, please oh. leave us with your final thoughts. <laughs> I don't know if you're sick of hearing me, you guys, no, but never. I will tell you, I will tell you final thoughts. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Okay. Take your time, slow it down, write it down, be prepared and choose your battle. Believe it or not, not everything is urgent. And I still suffer from this. I'm human. And I got so upset over something the other day. And as I reflected later that night, I thought it wasn't even that urgent for me to get upset about. So choose your battles wisely. Know your part, know your role. Part of that is, is validating facts. And part of that is taking time to think about how other people, what the issue, how it impacted their role. Okay, really, really important. Keep an open mind. Read a little bit about growth mindset if you have the chance, but keep, keep an open mind. See things from others' perspectives. And I'm serious about this. I can't see you guys now, but don't, don't roll your eyes. The chain of command is there for a reason. We all learned it early on in nursing school when it has to do with patient care to use the chain of command. And, and we are all at leaders, formal leaders in, um, in hospitals, we have a responsibility and we are regulated to provide a safe chain of command. And if you, if you really truly believe in your heart from a professional perspective that you have to go up the chain of command out of safety for your patient, out of perhaps a, a, a toxic environment, I encourage you to do your homework, be prepared, use the chain of command to your advantage. And then also know, know that you make a difference. We have the best job in the world that we get to make a difference in the lives of patients and their families, like in their trajectory of the lifespan of their family. We get to make a difference. You are valued and you're essential. And I just, I, 
I thank you. I thank you for being here and I thank you for being who you are. Lori, you're amazing as expected. We're so appreciative of all of your wisdom and your time. Um, as I mentioned before, we are recording this. We will share it afterwards. Um, and I will also share all the slides. So if you wanted those conversation starters or closers, those are gonna be there for you. So please know that you'll have access to that. And I will wait to share the wrap up email until I get that asset list from Lori, all those resources. Perfect. Um, thank you for all hanging in there with us. We really appreciate you. You're also going to get an email um, about how you thought about this event. Please give us your feedback. Um, we would love to know what you're looking for, if this satisfied what you were hoping for, and then for future ideas too. Um, again, thanks for joining us, and we hope we'll see you at another virtual event very soon. We have lots on the calendar for you. Bye, everybody. Night, have a great night. Bye.